So what am I going to cover? So first off, what is additive synthesis? And then I'm going to um, head off in a total tangent and talk about um, the Cordic algorithm, which is uh, a wonderful technique from the 1950s, which is kind of related to um, the next part, which was how can you make an additive synthesizer reasonably efficiently? Um, and then we can talk about harmonic generation, which is um, basically the next part of the puzzle, which is having built a, a, an additive engine, you need to actually basically give it some envelopes for the various harmonics. Um, and then just think through what that means if you build sound that way and build um, your, your basic fundamental oscillators that way, what creative opportunities you then get, which aren't uh, are sort of um, naturally available from, say, subtractive or sample-based instruments. So additive synthesis, what's that all about? Well, um, one of the first things you learn um, when you get involved with DSP is that a complex signal can be broken down to the sum of sine waves. This is sort of one of those things everyone gets, gets taught. And then if you're interested in synthesis, you immediately forget that and then start building saw waves and, and things like that using wavetables and, and all the rest of it. You, just, you, you don't continue that thought process. So let's, let's start there. Um, complex waves are made of the sum of sine waves. Um, what would happen if we built our oscillators by doing that in reverse. So we, we take sine waves and we, we build our complex waveforms, which are the ones we're interested in as the fundamental building blocks of our instruments, from, from sines. Well, what would we need to do? We'd need to have basically a number of sine waves where we can set, specify the pitch and the amplitude of those, those waves. Um, if you look at um, the timbre of a, of, a, of a sound, it isn't static except in some very rare and somewhat boring situations, so we're back to analog synths and, and how you get sort of saw waves and things like that. Most real instruments, the, the, the timbre changes over the life of the note. Um, so what we really want to be able to do is, is modulate the pitch and the amplitude over the life of the note. Now, pitch is an interesting one because most real instruments, um, the relationship between the, um, the fundamental and the overtones, the extra frequencies that appear is integer ratios. So there's a whole subcategory of what you can do with additive, which is more focused on um, what's um, pleasing to the ear and what actually happens in most instruments, which is that you end up with a, a harmonic series with an integer relationship between them. Um, and so if, we, if we, um, we think about that, that is actually quite a powerful model. It doesn't unfortunately cover everything that can happen and certainly doesn't cover a lot of the interesting um, sort of colorations that make sound particularly pleasing to our ears. Sort of the initial attack on a piano note is not a harmonic. If you, if you break it down into sine waves, it's not, there's no strong harmonic relationship there. But if we put that aside and think about the steady state of the note, this sort of, a, this sort of pattern emerges. Now, if we do this sort of... Um, thought process that we're summing sine waves together, um, a very sort of, again, thought process that you might have is, well, this is just Fourier analysis then, isn't it? We're just simply thinking about the frequency domain, and then what we do is that we build our sound in the frequency domain, convert it to the time domain, there's our sample. Well, that does work. However, there are quite a lot of interesting sounds that happen in the um, in, in, in sort of instruments, um, say, um, sort of zap sounds or, or sort of electric tom sounds that are basically sine waves that descend in pitch very quickly. So if you were to model that in an additive synth, you might just say, well, it's, a, it's, it's one single sine wave and the pitch changes over the life of the note. Um, if you try and think of that in the frequency domain, what instead you see is um, basically an impulse response and an even amount of energy at all frequencies, but the phase relationship between them is, is sort of skewed. So basically, it's a stretched impulse response. It's not necessarily a very... Um, it may not be a sound you want to recreate to start with, but certainly, if, if it is the sort of sound you want to recreate, it's easier and simpler in your head to think of it as one sine wave descending in pitch rather than lots of sine waves with some complicated phase relationship where most of this cancels out, leaving you this descending sine. So... Um, Keep that in your mind, but don't spend your time thinking, oh, this is just frequency domain stuff. Let's, let's 
stay in the, in the time domain. Um, this is, additive synthesis is not a new idea. In fact, realistically, if you sort of think of a history of synthesizers, it's one of the first electronic or ways of generating useful electronic sounds and tones that still to this day we think are absolutely amazing. So if you think about a Hammond organ from what the, the mid-30s onwards, um, the, it's a mechanical system with various wheels that have got, um, I think, undulations in the edges and pickups and things. Um, and the, the tone is created by choosing different harmonics um, from um, sort of, I think there's nine harmonics that you can choose, which is a fixed relationship. And every time you press a note, you get that range based on that fundamental um, oscillator that you've chosen. Um, there's no modulation, so basically it's like this problem where the tone is sort of static, but you solve that problem by applying effects afterwards. You put Leslie's on and things like that to create movement. And also, because of the, um, I would say, inaccuracies, like the, the attempt to build the pure sine waves for these oscillators, because of the failures in that, there's a lot of character, a lot of interesting grinding and, and, and sort of cogging type sounds that come out. Um, so that's an important part of the sound. But fundamentally, though, you could look at it and say it's really an additive synth with, with um, nine harmonics. Um, now, if you then go forward in time and think about what then happened with instruments, um, we hit the sort of analog age where people were building interesting oscillators. Additive is not easy in, I say easy, maybe even possible, um, realistically, in in analog tech. The reason for this is that you need the harmonics to have a, a strong frequency relationship. And if you get drift between the harmonics, it tends to mess up the sound. So really, additive is an approach in... I've disappeared. I've come back. Um, analog in, in the, um, as, as, a, as a synthesis technology didn't really play well to additive approaches. And we need to wait for the sort of, the sort of digital age before some commercially successful additive synths appeared. And this is my favorite, the, the Kawai K5000, which um, my one has keys which are about as yellow as this picture I've found on the internet. Um, it's an interesting instrument because clearly um, when they were building it, um, there was limitations of what they could achieve. Um, it's got 64 harmonics per note. Um, it's got quite a limited number of, of additive voices that you can use at a given time, but it combines it with um, basically a sample playback, and there was all sorts of little clicks and ticks that you could add to create the initial attack on tones, um, and some interesting um, filtering stuff, and I think by far the most ghastly digital filter ever made in a commercial synthesizer. Um, you have to try the instrument to really appreciate how bad it is. It, it clips horribly the... Um, um, it, the, the, the feedback control can't be changed while the note is playing, um, but the cutoff can. But if you turn it up, um, it does it just, just clip. Um, it's astonishing that it made it into the instrument, but there we are. Um, so um, I had to dig around on the net because, you know, being a fan of this instrument, um, and I went to vintagesynth.com, and I found these two comments about the instrument, which I think tell us everything we need to know about additive. Um, I sold mine horrible machine to program and simply the best synth ever. Um, alongside that is this astonishing photo I also found on the web where somebody has taken two K5000s, dismantled them, and rebuilt them as a sort of a dual manual Franken synth with custom case. And I believe there's even foot pedals as well in this, in this arrangement. So this is clearly somebody that just loves these instruments. Um, and so this is what makes me think there is something exciting to explore here. And that, and that sort of chalk and cheese reaction to this is really about how impossible it is to program these things versus how interesting the sounds can be that come out of them. So depending on your mindset, whether you just play the presets or you want to get stuck in and start playing with it, back in this era of the little LCD screen, programming 64 envelopes with multiple points and loops and things was just really, really painful. However, these days, if you're interested in this stuff, you don't have to go and buy a 90 synth. You can just go and probably, if you've got Logic on your machine, you've already got Alchemy, which is an additive synth, um, NI Make Razor. I think 
I believe all of the major doors have an additive synth of some description packaged with them. This is, you know, absolute standard stuff. But again, it's not an easy go-to. People don't sort of naturally think, gosh, you know, I've, I've installed um, Logic. Let's go and start playing around with Alchemy and creating my own sounds. That's not, it's not an easy, easy step. So when I spoke before about um, um, the timbre of the tone changing over time, I thought it'd be quite interesting just to look quickly at a sample. Um, this is a, a spectrogram view of, of a sample. And then let's think about what, what we're really talking about here. So um, in this case, I've played a, a low C on a Rhodes. In fact, it's a sample of a Rhodes. Um, not one of mine. I don't have a Rhodes. That would be nice, but I don't. Um, and what you see are these strong horizontal lines. These are the, the fundamental frequency and the overtones just coming through loud and clear. Because this is a logarithmic plot, we see even spacing between the, the overtones up the axis as, as, we, you know, as we go up and up this um, harmonic series. Um, actually, no, it's not. There is logarithmic, so we don't. Um, <laughs> they're more closely spaced at the bottom, and, and, they, and they shrink towards the top. But that's, that's um, um, giving us a, a clear indication that a majority of the tone of this is these strong fundamental and overtones. We can see some holes in the, um, the if, you, if you look at like the sixth, seventh harmonic, you can see that the tone sort of disappears, turns to zero and comes back again. Goodness knows what's happening there. It's, it's possibly the time changing from, you know, different modes of oscillation, who knows. But the energy moves around between these, these harmonics in a, in a very pleasing and sort of gentle way. Um, Right at the beginning of the sample, hidden slightly by the, um, the um, uh, insert point, you can see that, I mean, if you look right at the bottom, you can see there's a lot of, of um, orange, yellow. There's a lot of energy at the initial onset of the sound, which is not harmonically related. This is the kind of attack, twang, that you get. Um, that is a, an interesting area, as I said. We were not going to really delve in how you would model that with additive, because I think you can. I'm, I'm not going to. It's probably easier just to use samples for that sort of thing. Uh, by comparison, um, this is what a crash symbol looks like. So when we're back to talking about um, recreating um, timbre with an with a additive synth, you're not going to have much fun with a crash symbol. You're not going to sort of say, stick a sample in, do some analysis. Oh, look, here's something that sounds like a crash symbol. It's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that there's not interesting stuff to be extracted from this. Um, but it's, what you end up with is not going to be that tone. In reality, though, most things look a bit like this. So this is a, this is a, a patch from Equator. I can't remember which one it is. Um, chosen basically at random by fiddling through the presets. Uh, you can see the strong harmonic structure again, like you did on the, on the roads. Um, it tends to sustain through the note because it's a pad sound. But there's a lot of other stuff going on. And we can see down in the lowest frequencies, we see a lot of, lot of harmonic uh, content down there. Um, and realistically, the, the, the um, harmonics aren't strong lines. You can clearly see that there's some detail between them. This will be noise or, or other, other content, non-harmonic stuff. We see a couple of strange little clicks and things later on. Um, you can see all vertical lines through the spectrogram that, a discontinuity of some sort. It, it might be the um, sort of a badly constructed loop, but probably isn't. It's probably another little incidental sound that comes in late with a sort of a strong attack. So these are going to be difficult things to model well with additive. OK, that gives you a bit of a background there. So next, I'm going to talk about um, the Cordic algorithm. Now, this is um, kind of related, kind of related. We'll get there in the end. So the question is really, um, imagine it's the 1960s and you're an engineer and somebody asks you what the sine of 0.3 is in radians. What you do is you grab your trusty slide rule and some lookup tables and start fiddling around and come up with an estimate or whatever it is. It's, it's not fun. Um, but imagine you know, you, you're, you're a, an electronic engineer and you're wanting to sort of, sort of see you know, the world is changing, computers are coming along, and you're thinking, wow, I wonder if I can make some some sort of product that would, would allow us to do this sort of thing. Well, clearly what you want is some algorithm that allows you to generate the sign quickly. Unfortunately, um, pre-microprocessor, the ability to, 
to, to do calculations is somewhat limited, and you've really got adders and, and shift, bit shift, and that's about it, really. Um, so you can kind of do multiplies, but they're expensive, divides, mm, um, how on earth do you get a sine function? You, you can't do sort of a Taylor expansion and, and, and sort of throw your floating point unit at it. It's not going to work like that. So the aside on like 90 degree turn from the 90 degree turn, let's just quickly recap complex numbers. So for mathematicians here, you go, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, for everybody else, um, this all stems from a problem, a fundamental problem, which is that you can't square root negative numbers. Um, this, this was discovered a long time ago, and everyone just said, there is no square root for a negative number. But there's another train of thought, which is, well, imagine if there was a square root of minus one, and we're going to call it i. It's just a made-up number called the imaginary number. We square it, we get minus one. We can then think of numbers as being a real component, the ones that we normally think of, in this case, I've just referred to it as A, and some amount of this imaginary component, we'll call that B. Um, so a complex number is a number formed of two parts. One is the real one, that we, the one that we see in everyday life, and one is this um, component, which is actually at, at right angles, um, or you can think of it as being at right angles, which is this imaginary, imaginary component. Um, when you multiply two complex numbers together, what happens is you kind of do the equivalent of expanding out the brackets as if it was 1 plus 2 times 3 plus 4, and you multiply each of the terms together. Um, but of course, you keep the i's in there. And then if you look at the expansion, you see you get ac plus adi plus bci plus bdi squared. And we know that i squared is minus 1, so that turns into a real component of minus bd. So we can rearrange it, and we get ac minus bd plus ad plus bci. Now. Another really interesting aspect of this is if we think of our complex number as having because that's got two components, we plot it on, on um, a, an x and a y axis. We can, we can also then think of these as vectors, as being um, um, a, a magnitude in a particular direction. So this is like a polar coordinate version view of, of a complex number. When we do this multiplication of two complex numbers, what we discover is this interesting property that um, the, the, the angles of the two input numbers add, and the magnitudes multiply. So what we end up with is this um, alternative view of what uh, complex multiplication really is. You can, you can think of it as a scaling and a rotation, or you can think of it as this sort of playing out of the, the, you know, the A plus B I, da, 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 da. Um, the... Um, the reason for this is fairly straightforward. If you've ever done sort of expansion of sine A plus B, you get sort of sine A cos B minus cos B of sine A, that kind of stuff. Um, and we see that sort of pattern emerging in this. And in actual fact, if you think about uh, making a, um, um, right angle triangles out of these vectors and think about what the lengths of each of the, the values is, you're getting those kind of sine and causes appearing, which is why this kind of stuff works. Um, OK, right, yes. Um, and this is sort of just reinforcing this. If, if we think of this in terms of um, complex numbers, um, the interesting thing is if we were multiplying by um, a, a polar, um, a, 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 um, a vector which is of, of length 1, magnitude 1, then the, the, the magnitudes that multiply together is, is unchanged, and all we end up with is a rotation. So we can think of complex multiplication as rotation. Um, and in synthesizers, if you think about what we're trying to do with sine waves, there's like rotations going on. So this is quite an interesting idea. So back to the Cordic algorithm. So this is the stuff from um, the 1950s. This is an attempt to replace um, an analog computer with sort of digital electronics, uh, originally in bombers, I believe. But um, the, the idea is that you can take a lookup table of of unit vectors at different angles and choose the right ones to add together to end up with a target rotation. If you're smart about it, you can arrange it so that the, the vectors aren't necessarily of length one, because if you think about it, um, cos theta approaches one for small angles. Um, and so you, what you can do is you can kind of get away with one of the multiplies, because if you remember, back in the day, they didn't have multiply, they only had add, really. And so what you end up with is a very, very 
clever algorithm that ends up being bit shifts and adds. Um, and then it's a scaling factor that, that out, out. So there's like one divide at the end, or obviously it would be done as a multiply. Um, so that's what um, um, it's called Volder's algorithm. So um, Jack Volder came up with this in the, in the 50s. Um, and it was, I think, I don't know if it was secret for a bit, but it was ultimately published in 1960-something, uh, 1962 or 63 or something. Um, back to that original slide rule problem. Um, HP came along and said, we want to build um, an amazing device for engineers. And so they came up with this calculator, the HP 9100A in 1968. On the left is the prototype that looks like a prop from Blake 7 to me. Um, and this 1968, this, it's difficult to remember, this predates microprocessors. So there is no, there is no um, integrated circuit on this. This is all built from discrete logic and hand-wired, obviously, the prototype. And then on the right is the final, you know, this is the actual sold device. It was $5,000 in 1968. Um, and it took, I think, 300 milliseconds to do a sign calculation, which is and it, to 10 digits of accuracy. This is astonishing stuff. Um, I think there's um, other thing I, while I was researching this, um, there was a, I can't remember his first name, a, a Mr. Osborne was involved in this, but it's not the guy that came up with the first portable computer, unfortunately, which would have been even cooler. Now, come 1974, so we've got microprocessors appeared on the scene, um, Sinclair was trying to make a cheap electronic calculator that had sign as well. Um, they had a, 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 this um, chip from TI, um, and they didn't use Cordic. Um, I, 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 for, I'm not sure totally reasons why, but they only had 320 words of memory, and I think it wouldn't have fitted in. Um, but what they did was basically the algorithm that we're discussing. They, they, they took a, a rotation by um, 0 0.001 radian, um, and just applied it repeatedly. So if you wanted a sign of 0.5, it repeated the rotation 500 times and gave you the answer. It wasn't quick. Um, that would be the, 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 the key. I, I think, um, what was it? Sign of one takes seven and a half seconds. It's a lot faster and more accurate than getting out your slide rule. And it was $50. So in six years, we went from $5,000 to $50. And later that year, it was sold as a kit for $10. You assembled it yourself. This is... You know, the, the digital age is really quite astonishing stuff. So, back to this so what question. Well, um, for additive synthesis, we need a lot of sine waves. Um, so I just did a quick back of the envelope calculation. Um, if we work with 64 oscillators per voice and think of 32 voices, we're in the sort of 100 million sine calculations a second. We're not going to use the sine function. Um, we can. It's very accurate, but it's not very fast. Um, so instead, if we think of this vector rotation type approach, we instead of having a sign calculation do four multiplies and two adds, um, there's no conditional code paths, we get fuse multiply add, blah, 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 blah. Modern processes like algorithms like that. They're, they're good at it. So how do we do this? Well, obviously, we write it in Sol. That's, that's clearly the first step. Um, it's... it's Hopefully, a, um, a, a good place to start because it, it, it's reasonably clear, and hopefully, everybody can, can read and vaguely understand what's going on here. So, we have um, on the left um, what you might think of as being like a naive sign implementation using a phase and calling the sign function each, each time through the loop. And on the right, we've got this, I'm calling it Cordic. That's kind of a cheat, really. It's not really Cordic, it's vector rotation, but I like to, I wanted to talk about HP calculators because that prototype is so cool. So I've stuck with calling it Cordic. Um, so what we're doing is when we set the frequency, is we're, we're working out this unit vector. So again, we've got this, we're using the phase increment, and we're calculating a real number, a complex number, the real and the imaginary parts. Um, and then in our actual loop, all we're really doing is we're just multiplying the value by the multiplier. So we're causing a rotation, and we're outputting the imaginary value, which is the sine value. Um, that's it. So our inner loop, no, there's, there's no branches. It's, it's very, very simple. It, it optimizes rather well. Um, let's see that in action. So let's, let's see if I can manage to, to switch across. And um, let's see if I've got here. Um, OK, so this is that code that I just showed you. Um, and I can't see my screen. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong directory. I hit some demos.
So um, we have a sine wave. Um, we can change the frequency. So this is this algorithm working. If I just leave it running in the background there. One of the things that's slightly surprising and um, was one of the things I was interested in is how stable it is. Um, because clearly, if you think about it, we're rotating a vector 40,000 times a second. If it ventures off the unit circle, it could spiral up to infinity or down to a black hole. Um, but it doesn't. Um, that's interesting. Um, I've got another demo here, um, which is a comparison between those two algorithms. So you know, one of the concerns is, well, you know, why does this? Um, um, so this is the same as before, but I've got a mix. So on the left is the traditional sine calculation. On the right is the Cordic version. But we go to the middle. You can still hear it just about. So there is a there is a difference between these two approaches. Um, what's actually happening is. The, the phase increment, when applied multiple times, is introducing a little bit of like the, the frequency that you were actually generating slightly off. So it's getting slightly out of sync. Um, I've got a demonstration to show that using, um, oh no, that's the same one. Um, if I move it across to using um, float 64, what did I call this one? Oh yeah, float 64. So this is, um, the same algorithm with more precision, and then they do they do null in the middle there. For we'll except this, like you you've got someone's got amazing hearing can hear. I'm an old person, I can't hear anything, so don't ask me. Um, anyway, so there we are. So that's the basic algorithm in action. Um, now. Um, it doesn't, seem to, it doesn't seem to drift. It seems to be stable. It doesn't diverge from the sign very much. I mean, let's face it, we don't care if it diverges a bit. Um, we, well, I would conclude that it's the float 32 roundings for the phase that's causing this problem. Um, and as I said, calling it cordic is a stretch. Um, I think it was a better title, um, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, and yes, Jack Boulder, amazing work. Kind of the engineering stuff that we don't do anymore was happening in, in the 50s. Now, interestingly, the same approach can do a bank of oscillators, because if you think about what we were doing there, we were just doing this, our inner loop was just advancing, it was, multi, it was a one multiply, basically. Um, rather than having a single value um, and a single um, multiplier, what happens if we have a vector of them? Um, and this is what this code is doing. It's basically a vector. Um, a vectorized version of that same of that same function. Um, in terms of the actual run loop, or the, the logic that's going on, it's basically the same. We're we're doing the same value because value times multiplier to rotate all of these vectors. But then what we need to do is sum the imaginary values together. If we put some scaling on it, in this, this case some amplitudes, all of a sudden we're choosing a set of oscillators and then weighting them and summing them together. So if I show you a demo of that. Um, uh, um, I will pause that. Um, this is a saw oscillator, as uh, so the one, the example we've been shown there. Um, you might then start asking, well. Um, how do you deal with uh, Nyquist and things like that? Well, um, you'll see this line 20, which is basically saying, when I'm calculating the harmonic frequency, if they're too big, if they're above Nyquist, just don't include them in the output. So it's just basically zeroing out the amplitude. So if I take that out, we will, we will certainly hear the effect. Nice aliasing going on there, which is which is really 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 useful. Um, or alternatively, obviously, if we want to make this quite band limited, uh, let's let's say the frequency is up to four k. So that's quite effective. Very simple. Um, 
again, unlike thinking of um, as, a, as a new software engineer, rather than coming to DSP, thinking about the sorts of challenges that you have, um, aliasing is a fairly easy problem to resolve with additive, unlike a lot of other techniques where you spend quite a lot of time thinking about it, then heavy maths gets involved. So this is quite interesting that we can avoid some of that. Okay, that's, those are boring tones, though. Um, okay, yes. Key thing, though, there was that the vectorization and, and making a bank of oscillators is, is trivial. It's the same, it's the same algorithm. Um, Anti-aliasing is, again, trivial. Um, and really, what we're doing here is um, we're using CPU to calculate these sine waves rather than having, say, lookup tables, wave tables, all the rest of it. Um, so it's just a, a trade-off, and it might be the right one for your algorithm. But certainly, I think, from the complexity of the, of the algorithm, it's very easy to build a band-limited saw wave with with sine oscillators. Performance. Well, what I've done here is I've, I've built since using more and more sine waves. Um, and I'm comparing calling sine with this algorithm, which I've called Cordic, which is actually vector rotation. Um, as you can see, we end up with this 16 or 20 times faster from this algorithm. Uh, it's because the vectorization really helps this. Um, and the fact that there aren't any, any conditions, any branches in that, in that inner loop. So what we're up to, if you look at the, the, the figure on the, the, um, the right-hand side, 2,048 oscillators is enough for 32 voices with 64 oscillators per voice, which is kind of my benchmark for you know, a modern, fairly sensible synth. Um, you're in 4% utilization. Um, I tried this on, a, on an, uh, an M1, a modern ARM machine, and the, um, the vectorized version was still around 4%, but actually sign was quicker which surprised me. So I was, I was thinking, because obviously this is an AVX implementation, I was thinking, I'm, I'm sure M1 isn't as good as that, and it is. Um, and their sign, whatever algorithm they used, is, is faster than the Intel one. It may be less accurate, I don't know. But, it's, 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 um, but there's, still, there's still definitely an advantage. It was more like eight to 10 times quicker. So right, OK, we want to build an instrument. So we've got this sort of building block. I can think of two approaches. Um, you know, I can build saw waves using this. Let's just slap that in a, a subtractive synth. There we are. There's our oscillator type. Maybe give you some controls so you can alter the harmonics. Um, yes, you can do that. Um, it'll be alias-free. Um, you can do tone, cha tone shaping using filters as you do in the subtractive synth. But ultimately, why would you bother doing that? Because you've got things like Mimbleb, which work really well, and are, again, fairly simple algorithms. So that's probably not a great direction to go. The alternative is to build an additive synth. Like, let's just go, let's go additive. You, we can manipulate everything. No filters, no anything. It's just, it's just um, sine waves all the way. Um, how do you program it? I mean, realistically, I mean, and you've got no controls that mean anything to anybody that's built, being brought up with any other instrument. They haven't got a, a cutoff filter or something like that. So that's, that's kind of difficult. So I would suggest the middle ground. Something hybrid is probably the right way to go and the right way to think about this. Um, it keeps it familiar. We get some of these interesting um, shaping properties. Um, the, the purists get upset, and oh well. So we end up with something looking a little bit like this. So, so we stick our oscillator bank um, with some harmonics going in, which over time allows us to change the timbre of the tone. We, we tell it which frequency it wants to play at. We have sample playback and noises and all the rest of it, all, filled in, all going through our normal filter chain and effects. Um, and that then gives us a lot of the benefits without all of the pain, only some of the pain. Um, we fill in the gaps in what's easy to achieve with additive with the, other, with the other oscillators. So we add noise, we add attacks, transients, and things like that. This looks kind of like a K5000, weirdly enough. Um, right, so in that previous slide, um, harmonic envelopes. We, we need to um, generate, basically, if you think about our vectorized version, we've got a vector of 64 floats. We need to generate vectors of 64 floats indicating what the amplitude of each of the harmonics is per frame. Well, what I've done here is basically create an array of sized um, um, vectors, um, so the right number of harmonics. And then I just basically do, a, again, a, a vector add. So basically, I linearly interpolate between um, points in time. So what I'm proposing here um, is the source for the envelope, for the um, amplitudes 
feeding into this oscillator. It doesn't have to be sample by sample. We can, we can go with um, um, less granularity, um, um, trading off performance against um, memory use. Because basically, if, if, you've, if you've got the, this harmonic content for all of your oscillators, you're kind of looking at 64 samples, if you think, about it, think of it that way. It's a lot of memory use, and we probably don't need that. So then we've got this big table of, at this moment in time, the harmonic content of the note is this. And at this moment in time, the harmonic content is that. So it's like a spectrogram view. And, uh, you know, and then you in linearly interpolate between them. Um, well, that's great. But how do you get that information? Like, what do you, how do you generate that? Um, well, I'd suggest we start with samples, because they're out there. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could take a sample, have some way of just looking at the harmonic content on it, of it, and generating the, a table of of, of um, amplitudes. Um, well, we can use correlation for this. It's very, very simple, just because if, if we know what the fundamental is, we can know, we can look at the amount of energy at the fundamental, first, second, third harmonic. Um, that's the kind of that's the kind of algorithm. Um, what does this what does this actually look like? Well, on the right hand side is the noddy get me an envelope at this frequency out of this sample. Um, and ultimately, what it's doing is um, this is it's windowing a, a, a bunch of samples, estimating how much energy there is at a particular frequency, and then going to say, I'm going to use that as the envelope comp component. <clears throat> There's um, multiply by four in there, which I can't remember why there is, but I saw that this morning and thought, hey, why is it four? Anyway, um, that's for another day. Um, so let's, let's try all of this. So what I've got now is. Um, a simple tool, um, which is that envelope logic um, and a little bit of command line stuff that allows me to specify, look at this file, um, build me some amplitudes, and then it substitutes them into a sole template. So I've got a piece of code with some insert places. So what it's going to do is it's going to run through them. And I've got um, an example of that. It's this um, generate one here, which is 100 odd lines. Um, here's our amplitude source with the, the amplitudes that we've generated from the other, this piece of C++ code sort of stuck in the code there. Um, and then what's our, what have we got here? Oh, the oscillator bank. Um, oh, there's a special case for oscillator, uh, for a size one, because you can't sum um, a vector of one. That's a bug in Sol. Um, should just work, but it doesn't. Right, that's, that's it, though. Um, so if we come back to... Um, um, so here, what I've got here is a very exciting Perl script, because Perl is the future. Um, and what it does is it runs the analyze command on some samples, and they happen to be the ones that I built these spectrograms for earlier in, in the talk. So if I were to run this, let it chug away, um, I've told it, I've, by inspection, I've looked at the samples and I've said, uh, this is the, the, um, the fundamental frequency of these things. Um, and um, if I then um, go back here, I should be able to, if I can navigate on this thing, um, I should go, and if, I, if I start with, um, since we start with Hammond organs, of course, being the future and the past. Um, so this is the, the spectrum that I, that I showed earlier. Um, and that's a Hammondy type sound. Um, I've analyzed it, I've chopped it up, I've, I've said every 1,024 samples, find out how much energy there is in these harmonics, um, build an additive synth from it, which is a piece of soul code that is um, this here. Um, and so, as before, it's now got substituted in. Here is some, some envelope data. So it's got you know, 300 snapshots of this is the energy in these harmonics at this point in time. Um, and then what that generates as an output, I've, I've then run that, um, is this sample. So if we go back to the original. And then the additive rendered version. That's pretty possible, right? Works for me. Um, if we just um, bring up um, a spectrum analyzer, on this, and we go and look at the original. Um, 
whilst it's playing. We see kind of the movement of the harmonics. We see a load of noise in the higher frequencies, things like that. If I look at my rendered version, you can, we can clearly see the 64 harmonics that are being generated. Um, and if I, if I just sort of compare a moment in time, so this is the, the, the spectrum response of the, the original sample. No, that's the original sample. And that's my one. Um, they're pretty close. Um, and that's why it sounds the same. Basically, uh, and we're, you know, we're playing to the strengths there. That, that instrument has got all of that energy at the right. You know, it's, it's, it's playing to the strengths of additive synthesis. Um, not everything works as well as that. Um, so then now the other samples I talk about are things like um, the crash symbol. So what happens if we um, take a crash symbol? Um, and we think, right, I'm going to do an additive synthesis of that. I, I, you, you sort of look at it and think, well, what's, what's the fundamental? And you look at that, and there isn't. So you pick one at random. That's my advice. You just choose a frequency. And I, I think I chose, it was in here, about 400 hertz or something. Um, and you say, well, that, that looks, that's good. And so then we have a crash symbol. Here's the regenerated crash symbol. <laughs> Not so good. Um, OK, so maybe that's not the best application for the technique. Um, but I have got some other samples here. And there's, there's a, I, I mentioned a, like a Rhodes or something. Um, and um, the, the rendered Rhodes is quite interesting. It looks quite like the original. It's sounding quite nice. It's got a bit of movement. I mean, it's, it's, it's lost the initial attack. The, the initial isn't, isn't there. It's, it's all right, but it's not, not perfect. Um, I haven't used many. I think I've only used 32 sine waves for this, so it was a bit of a trade-off there. Anyway, um, as long, alongside this, I also stick out some instruments which are which are based on this same. Uh, so rather than just rendering the sound, um, their instruments. So if we, um, if I try playing like the, the Hammond organ instrument, I end up with a with a velocity sensitive Hammond, which is a strange thing. We simply hear the movement, but it doesn't sound too bad shifted quite a long way. Um, and it'll, it'll run out of um, envelope at the end. But anyway, there we are. So um, you can build instruments using this technique. So that, oh, sorry, my nose is dribbling. Um, we mentioned um, that you know to build a proper instrument, you would probably have noise sources and, and other things just to, 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 to help. Um, that's fine. Um, the other thing I just wanted to briefly talk about, and I know I'm probably way over time, um, is um, um, things you can then do, which are, which are different. Now, once you've broken down your sound, sign, your, uh, sound into sine waves, you can manipulate them in ways that are difficult with samples. So you can look at individuals within the, like, like say, the even and odd harmonics and process them separately to, to the whole sound. Um, I've got a list here of, of, uh, of sort of suggested things to explore. Um, morphing is also another, another really powerful technique you can do here. Um, and um, going through envelopes at a different rate than they were originally recorded. So that crash symbol, actually, if you slow it down, sounds quite interesting. But if I come quickly back here, um, and um, there is a, a version with some extra controls to try and help show some of this stuff out. Um, so this version here, I can say, for example, only listen to the to the odd or the even harmonics, which is quite an interesting control. And you can imagine mapping things like that to aftertouch and, and just sort of creating more more interesting things. Yes, yeah, so the rate at which we're running through the envelope, we can speed it up and slow it down which, again, is a difficult control to do with using any other technique. So I think there's some, sort of to wrap this up, I think there's some really interesting, um, there's some really interesting creative opportunities in this, in this space. I think the, 
the way of thinking about it is um, certainly different and maybe more intuitive for people coming new to synthesis. Um, it might um, have limitations when we talked about the, the accuracy of doing things like sample, sample replay. It, it's got clearly things that are difficult, but um, I think rather than um, rather than seeing the flaws in, in the approach, I think you need to write and, and think about the advantages and play to the strengths of it. And if you do that, I think you'll create some interesting and, and different sounds, which is um, what I like people to go away and get inspired by. All of the source that you've seen there is all on the uh, websites in GitHub. But at the beginning of the talk, there was a... Um, I put it at the beginning, of course, which is... Uh, top tip, don't do that. Um, it's mentioned there. Um, so if you go to my GitHub, you'll find that all of that source, the sole code and the generator, the, the sample analysis and those, and those exciting samples are all there as well. Um, so you should be able to have a play yourself. Um, there we are. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Chess. Um, I was wondering if you've tried putting it onto some sort of, well, I mean, embedded-ish device. I know that, like... You could run Sol on a, on a Bella or a Bella Mini. Have you tested any of the constraints there? Um, yes, I've, I've tested it on, on um, small ARM boards. I don't have performance numbers for those, but I'd expect it to be the same sort of trade-off. Um, interestingly, when, when you're sort of designing this, um, choosing how many harmonics you're going to use is the key to it. There's, this, this bit of code here just, just goes through and uses every single one. There's absolutely no reason you need to do that. You could very easily analyze. So say you know that you can support 32 harmonics, but not more. You can choose your 32. The, the algorithm is totally uh, agnostic as to what the frequencies are. And it will also do, I, I haven't touched on um, the fact that you can modulate the, the pitch of these oscillators as well, um, which again creates other interesting, interesting opportunities. But, but certainly rather than just like front loading everything, adding higher ones um, helps people with who can hear above 8K, unlike me. So. Um, or 10k, something around there. Thanks. Uh, okay, we've got a couple of questions uh, online. Um, so first from uh, Daniel Rudrich, who um, is uh, asking about uh, numerical stability. So he says, mm -hmm. um, do numerical errors of the rotation algorithm or the cordic affect the amplitude of the sign? Uh, will it explode eventually or go to go to silence? I know you did touch on this uh, briefly, but any more yeah, um, I've, comments I've, on that? I've run it 24 hours, and it's been fine. Um, I, I haven't done... I don't actually understand why it's stable. Um, I, there's, it's, it's a subject in itself, I think. I mean, there's a PhD in, in how you analyse how floating point behaves. But um, I have a, my, my instinct is that um, it's almost like... Um, I think rather than actually rotating and being circular, I think it ends up being squashed. It's, it's probably oval, um, and it kind of goes out on when it's positive and comes back in when it's negative. Or so. it'd be something odd like that. But I've not I've not done the analysis. So, so you might get some extra harmonics in there, but it basically stays but within, it's basically, within, yeah, within yeah. range. Yeah. Okay. And then the other um, question we have, uh, if you're able to answer this one, um, uh, Yaroslav says um, you've been using Soul uh, for the for the demos, obviously. Um, is it still viable to use it in projects? There haven't been any updates to the Sol uh, project in um, quite a while. So what's going on with that? Well, I'm, I no longer work on the Sol project. It was, um, it's part of uh, Roly or Luminary, as they're now called. Um, so it's really a question for them about, about what, they're, what they're up to with it and what, what their plans are. Thank you very much. Uh, any more in the room? I see no more in the room. Oh, one. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, thank you for a great talk. Um, just really quickly, you touched on um, generating sounds uh, based on other samples. Um, from a design perspective for end users, uh, how do you envisage, envisage um, end users uh, being able to control all of those um, uh, envelopes themselves? Is there a practical way to, um, to create uh, a good interface to, to use that power? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's so I think I think you, we should step away from thinking about having a sort of overlay of sixty-four or one hundred and twenty-eight envelope shapes. I think a sort of a spectrogram view and sort of paint tools, like more like dodge and burn from sort of Photoshop, would be the way I would see it. Um, you want to paint in extra harmonic detail. Um, that would be, you know, or, or change the character. But then obviously, as I said, because we've also, I would suggest also putting more traditional filters in there as well. There's then uh, possibilities of maybe looking at 
at, at using uh, keeping the harmonic content fixed and using other techniques to to make those modifications. But yeah, I would I would certainly say it's a there's a lot of um, different possibilities there, and that's definitely worth exploring. <laughs>